have uh, Chairman John Kester, who's been on the committee a long time as ranking member, is now chairman. He is from Montana. And ranking member uh, Jerry Moran, again, a long-term uh, committee member, is now uh, from Kansas, a uh, ranking member. In the House, uh, the Democrats did maintain their majority. Mark, uh, Mark Tejano uh, maintains his chairmanship, and he's from California. And ranking member Mike Voss uh, is from Illinois as ranking member. And on uh, this slide deck, I put all of the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee members and uh, a list of the House uh, Affairs Committee members. So be sure to take a look at those. Make sure if you've got someone on the committee, that's a great uh, asset. And you want to definitely reach out and make sure that you make contact with them. So uh, if we need some assistance, we'll be calling you perhaps on a you know action alert, a piece of legislation, and your member may be one of the people that's a key person in that that fight. So please uh, do that if you haven't already. Today we're just going to provide you an update on the critical policy goals uh, for the 117th Congress. So each of the staff will be covering their uh, policy issues, protecting uh, or toxic exposures first, which you've heard a lot about if you've been following uh, following along. Shane will be talking about that, protecting our veterans in the place and the field process. Tony's going to give you a little bit of an overview. Jeremy on expanding survivors' benefits and legislation that's been introduced. And um, our people will be covering ensuring um, equity for uh, women and minority veterans, and uh, as well as, um, I'm sorry, that staff is going to cover that. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know you guys kind of both, but Ashley will be doing that. Marquis is going to cover uh, mental health and um, suicide prevention services along with some update on the independent budget uh, recommendations. And then um, I will wrap up with building a veterans health care system for the future. Again, uh, DAV is part of the independent budget along with the DFW and the EVA. And so just want to make you aware on uh, DAV's uh, website under our legislative advocacy section, there's a resources page where we include the independent budget, where we've got the policy recommendations for the 117th Congress and uh, the ID numbers for FY22. And the last thing uh, for me, just as our opener here, uh, just as a reminder, make sure that you uh, make yourself available for um, tomorrow afternoon, 2 o'clock, we will have our DAV Service and Legislative Seminar. And our VA guest this year will be Mr. Michael Fu. He is the Principal Deputy Undersecretary for DBA. And we have Dr. Carolyn Clancy. Uh, she is the Assistant Undersecretary for Health, for Discovery, Education, and Affiliate Network uh, from the CHA side. Make sure you come early and get a seat. So, uh, don't start, we'll start promptly on that. Uh, Jim and I will be moderating that session. And then I'll be joined by Shane, and Jim will be joined by Scott Cope. And we're gonna be doing an open mic, uh, town hall style, uh, ask your questions about uh, DAV legislative issues, or benefits issues, or anything that's on your mind. So think about questions that you'd like to get an update on, um, and we will do our best to answer those. And I'm gonna turn it over to Shane. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I take it I'm loud enough and I don't need the microphone closer. <laughs> Correct? Right. All right. So let's go ahead and get ready, strap yourselves in, Get ready to feel the cheese. Are you guys ready for this? Ah, <laughs> uh, that was, that was <laughs> Let's try that again. Are you guys ready for this? <laughs> All right, hey, here we go. A little update on toxic exposures and specifically DAD's critical policy goal of 2021, which is to ensure veterans who were exposed to toxic substances 
receive full attachment benefits, particularly for burn pits, Agent Orange, and other known, known exposures. So what we're gonna cover real quickly this morning with you is a couple of the updates. One, specific to the Veterans Burn Pit Recognition Exposure Act. Two, we're gonna talk about other exposures and some of the bills that are out there for Agent Orange, K2 radiation risk activities for McClellan and PFAS exposure. And then we're gonna round it out. There are two major toxic exposure bills or omnibus bills, one in the House and one in the Senate, that are currently pending. And I'm gonna run through those with you a little bit just to give you an idea of what's going on with those larger bills. So first up is the Veterans Burn Pit Recognition Exposure Act. And as uh, many of you know, currently VA is denying roughly 77% of all burn pits related disability claims. 77% are being denied. The Veterans Burn Pit Recognition Exposure Act would concede exposure based on country. It would also concede exposure to over 40 VA accepted toxins that they have identified being related to burn pits. And it would also require the VA to provide a medical exam and an opinion if needed to grant the claim. So this is a very important piece of legislation. We're very fortunate that last Congress, and again this Congress, we got it introduced in the Senate by Senator Sullivan out of Alaska and Senator Manchin out of West Virginia, a bipartisan bill, S-437. There are currently 38 co-sponsors in the Senate. I know you might be thinking, well, Shane, 38 doesn't sound like a big number. Well, it's not a big number, but guess what? That's over a third, I'm a Marine, I can do math, it's over a third of the Senate. So think about that, over a third of the Senate is a co-sponsor of this bill. It passed last year in the Senate fairly easily. Uh, the Veterans Affairs Committee, not the Senate itself. So we're feeling pretty good about where it is. Now, we testified on this bill earlier this year in March and in April before the Senate. And look at that number. Over 9,600 emails were sent by you guys and your networks back in your departments and your chapters through DAB's Commander's Action Network, DAB CAM. Who CAM? DAB CAM. DAB CAM, let's try that. <laughs> Who can? We can. All right, we're all on the same page. So no, really, that's important. 9,600 emails. So thank you for reaching out to your senators. Now this year was also introduced into the House by Representatives Slotkin and Meyer, both out of Michigan. So if there's any Michiganders out there, you need to make sure you thank them. There are 45 co-sponsors in the House. We testified on this bill in the House on May 5th and 5,327 emails were sent by all of you. So again, thank you for being engaged and involved and keep building those networks you have within your chapters and departments. So this bill not only is supported in both chambers, it's bipartisan support in both chambers. So both Republicans and Democrats are on board with the bill and we have eight national VSOs and MSOs that are on board and formally support this bill too. So it is a good piece of legislation. We're feeling good about it. And when I start talking about the two omnibus bills in a little bit, the major bills that are pending, the provisions of our, this Veterans Permit Recognition Exposure Act are also part of that, those two bills. And we'll get into that in just a little bit. So there's an update on the Veterans Permit Recognition Exposure Act that was based on a DAB original idea and is currently pending in the House and in the Senate. So that brings us to a whole slew of other exposures. So let's just go ahead and jump right into these. We're gonna start first with Agent Orange. In the Senate and the House, there was a bill called the Fair Care for Vietnam Veterans Act. This will add new presumptive diseases to the Agent Orange disease list. Those two diseases are hypertension and monoclonal gamma, monoclonal gamma of undetermined significance. Kind of like me sometimes, undetermined significance. We also call it MGUS, and it is a rare blood type of condition that can have a negative impact on long-term health. So that bill is going to add those two conditions. We testified on this bill twice, actually three times on the two bills. 
twice in the House and once in the Senate. And look at that. 18,000 emails were sent by all of you to your members of the House and in the Senate. So again, thank you very much. You can applaud yourselves, it's okay. There you go. And while we keep that in mind, I just want all of you to remember, build those networks in your chapters and department. Get more signed up for the DAB Commander's Action Network because not one of us at this table can do it by ourselves and not one of you out there can do it. It takes the entire DAB and the entire community to put pressure on our elected officials to make sure we get it done. More Agent Orange issues is the Veterans Agent Orange Exposure Equity Act. What this would do would formally codify and put into law veterans who served in Thailand <coughs> as being exposed to Agent Orange. This bill would also add veterans who served in Laos and Cambodia as well. We testified on this bill uh, a few times on the Thailand issue and on Laos and Cambodia. Another toxic exposure issue that a lot of you may be familiar with is what we call K2. There was a military base in Uzbekistan that the United States military used between 2001 and 2005 called Kashi Kanaban, K2. There were a lot of toxins there, and so our service members who served there were exposed. What the K2 Veterans Act would do, and DAV supports, would establish presumptive service connection and health care for those with diseases contracted from survey at K2. We've also testified on this bill twice. And again, look at that, 14,000 emails, people. Thank you so much. Keep up the work on the DAV Commander's Action Network. We're also going to talk real quick about radiation risk activities. There is the Atomic Veterans Healthcare Parity Act. What this would do is it would consider veterans who served in the Iwataka total cleanup from January of 1977 to 1980. It would consider them as being a participant in a radiation risk activity. We testified on this bill twice. Almost 13,000 emails from all of you. And why is this important, you may be thinking? Well, guess what? If they're considered part of a radiation risk activity, they can get health care from the VA if they have no other eligibility. So this is huge. And it's not just them. There's another group. Palomaris cleanup. There was a uh, crash. A couple of uh, airplanes banged into each other over Spain. Four nuclear warheads dropped, and radiation was spread in parts of Spain. There was a cleanup by the US from 66 to 67. We've testified on this bill, and again, if it's considered a radiation risk activity, not only will they be eligible for presumptive service connection, but more importantly, they'll be eligible for health care. Fort McClellan. Not enough people have been talking about Fort McClellan, but there's a lot more talk on the Hill on this issue than there has been. And right now, there is a, the Fort McClellan Health Registry Act. DAB supports this. We've testified on this. And what it would do is it would establish a health registry for those who served at Fort McClellan between January 1st, 1935 to the time of the close, May 20th, 1999. They want to start tracking all of those who served there, their disabilities, diseases, and exposures. And this is going to be hopefully a precursor to trying to establish presumptive service connection for conditions related. We're not all the way there yet. But again, this is the first time we've gotten any traction on Fort McClellan on the Hill in many, many years. So this is also exciting. Contaminated water is another exposure we're looking at, and it's specifically PFAS exposure. PFAS is a very long, technical, big, giant science word, so we'll keep this short and sweet for us Marines in the room. It's a chemical that's called a forever chemical that is found in firefighting foam. How many military installations and Navy ships have a lot of firefighting foam? Yeah, all of them, right? They have found this toxic chemical in over 600 military installations water supplies. So they're still trying to figure it out. We attended a few roundtables and discussions. They're still trying to figure out the long-term health impact. But what they, this bill would do is, again, establish a registry to start tracking all of those negative health concerns. So now that brings us to the two large toxic exposure omnibus bills, one pending in the Senate called the Cost of War Act, one pending in the House called the 
I just drew a complete blank. The Honoring Our Pact Act, that, just had to reboot it there for a second. So first we're gonna talk about the Cost of War Act. This was introduced by Senator Tester, who was the chair of the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee. And basically, this is a combination of 14 different pieces of toxic exposure legislation. Pretty much all those bills I just talked about are all a part of this very large bill. What it would do is it would expand VA healthcare and provide healthcare eligibility for veterans exposed to toxins and most importantly, exposed to burn pits. If they have no other eligibility, they'd be eligible for healthcare solely in the fact they were exposed to burn pits. It would also start some of the reforming process for determining presumptive diseases in the future by creating a few different groups and commissions to help determine what diseases are related, not just for toxins and burn pits, but for all exposures. And what it would also do is, we talked about that concession of exposure a little bit ago for our burn pits bill. Part of that is in here, because what it will do, they're gonna add some presumptive diseases, but if you have a condition that's not a presumptive disease for burn pits, they have to determine, give you an exam, and run through everything, just like our bill suggested, to determine if it's related. Now, what it's also gonna do is provide a list of presumptive diseases, over 20. Most of them are all <coughs> respiratory conditions like asthma, COPD, sinusitis, rhinusitis, uh, bronchial restrictive airway disease, a few other conditions, but most importantly also respiratory cancers of any type. It'll also add glioblastomas. For those of you like Shane who's not sure what that means and had to look it up on the old <laughs> Google, that is a type of brain tumor. So brain tumors and brain cancers have been linked to toxic exposures and burn pits as well. The Cost of War Act, as we said, for Agent Orange, it would also add hypertension and MDS as presumptive diseases and add Thailand, Cambodia, Guam, and America Samoa as places conceded exposure to Agent Orange. It would also add the radiation risk activities that we talked about some additional requirements on VA, some more studies and registries, and force DOD to have better record keeping and record sharing with VA. So you can tell this is a pretty massive bill. It's an omnibus bill, omnibus bill the Cost of War Act. And again, it was introduced and passed by the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee. It'll be hard to find online because they haven't assigned a number yet, so you can't go to congress.gov and find it. But it's out there, we support the bill. And what they're currently waiting on is tech assistance from the VA to go through all the provisions and make sure all of this is workable. And they're waiting for the Congressional Budget Office, CBO, to project a cost. Now we're hearing some early estimates, and I'm just gonna throw it out there, it's not official, we heard some guesstimates. This bill would cost $1.5 trillion over 10 years. Exactly, it's not a small one. So again, we have concerns that even though this is a very passionate issue for a lot of politicians, what are they gonna now point to? Well, it just cost them. Well, I'd love to take care of you, Mr. Veteran, but yeah, the bill's too high. And what do we say to that? We say one thing, we already paid the price once, right? We already said we paid the price. And, Doing the right thing for veterans exposed to toxins should never have a price tag. Here. So let's compare that to the Honoring Our Pact Act. There's a few differences. There is a few changes to reforming the presumptive disease process. They would add a few more steps. We're not really sold on those, but we still support the bill. And some other differences are this would add eight additional types of presumptive diseases, specific types of cancers. So any type of cancer of the head, neck, gastrointestinal, reproductive lymphomas, lymphatic, kidney, and melanomas. So again, you're looking at a very large toxic bill that add a lot of presumptive diseases. Chairman DeCano of the House Veterans Affairs Committee introduced and supports this bill. Again, based on multiple pieces of legislation, we support it. And they're estimating this would actually cost more than the cost of war act. But again, they're waiting on 
tech assistance from VA, cost estimates from the Congressional Budget Office. But let me be clear, these two bills, they're the most comprehensive toxic exposure bills ever introduced into the House or the Senate. We're at a historic moment right here. So what do we need everybody to do? That's right, contact your congressman, your senators, your representatives, and I'm going to give you a quick place to go. Go to dab.org slash It's a separate page we get set up for toxic exposures. There's a link right on there for you to contact your senators and representatives through the DAB cam. The DA what? Yeah. Who can? Yeah. And somebody told me I wouldn't be able to train these guys. <laughs> so that wraps up all of what I had for you this morning. Thank you all for being here. And again, we went over the Veterans Benefit Recognition Act, all the different exposures, and the very large omnibus bills. So make sure you stay strapped in because, oh, we're not even close to being done yet. Are you guys ready for what's coming next? That's right, you're like lunch meat, you're always ready. So again, I'm Shane, I'm the Deputy Legislative Director. There's my information, you feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. I'll be here the whole time in the convention, just run me down. And coming up next, we're going to bring our very own Assistant Legislative Director, Jeremy Villanueva. Ladies and gentlemen, give us some good applause.
<clears throat> we have been fighting for this for a very long time, and we can say with 100% certainty that this would not have been possible without the advocacy and actions that you have done. So we want to thank you for all your efforts sending emails, calling your representatives, sharing the alerts on social media, and keeping the messaging going. I always say sign up to the Commander's Action Network or DAV can, because who can? DAV. Well, guess what? We not only can, but we did. And that's all directly because of you. So please give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> but are we done? Heck no. Our resolution number 360 states that we must advocate to lower the remarriage age for survivors of disabled veterans. And we will do just that. <clears throat> Currently, we're the remarriage age of 55, which is on par with average for federal employees. But this does not take into consideration the inherent danger that is faced day to day of our military service members, nor the much younger age of those who lose their loved ones in service or due to an illness or injury incurred in service. We will keep fighting until those survivors can live their lives, not having to worry about benefits earned through sacrifice and loss being stripped away due to arbitrary age. So this leads us to the value of the DIC benefit. So currently, if a veteran has 100% merit, they would be able to receive approximately $3,300. And when that veteran passes away, the spouse, if eligible, would receive $1,300. This equates to a loss of approximately $24,000 a year. This sudden loss of income can be catastrophic. And because of this, we are advocating to increase the DIC amount to 55% of what a totally disabled veteran who is married would receive and adjust it annually for inflation. This increase of $500 a month might not seem like much, but for this benefit, which has been minimally adjusted since 1993, it is sorely needed. In addition, DAV has strongly advocated for a reduction of the 10-year rule for DIC eligibility. So currently, a veteran who is totally disabled and would have to retain that rating for 10 years to ensure that their survivors are eligible for DIC if they pass away due to a non-service connected condition. <clears throat> this rule does not take into consideration caregivers, spouses who have sacrificed careers for their veterans, and dependent children who will lose their benefits if they also lose their parent premature. We are asking Congress to reduce this time period so that veteran survivors are not left with nothing if the veteran passes away prior to that 10 years. So this brings us to the Caring for Survivors Act. Now this is the second Congress that has introduced this legislation that includes both an increase in the DIC amount and a reduction of the 10 year time period for DIC eligibility. The Senate version, S976, has seen some movement, was even discussed in a hearing in April, but it only currently has six co-sponsors. The House version, <coughs> H.R. 3402, was introduced this past May and current, currently only has five co-sponsors. Now these numbers are just not good enough. We need you to contact your representatives and let them know that this legislation is important to the DA community. We need you to let them know that survivors and their families need the support of Congress. So please sign up for the Commanders Action Network and make your voice heard. In addition, the economic well-being of seriously disabled veterans, dependents, and their survivors should be safeguarded from arbitrary time limits. So with this in mind, we turn our attention to Dependents Educational Assistance, or Chapter 35. Now, Chapter 35 is much like the Montgomery GI Bill in its use, and is for spouses and children of seriously disabled veterans and their survivors, amongst others. And once an eligible dependent starts to attend a covered education or vocational training institution, the VA pays that person directly for tuition and supplies. However, for spouses who are eligible for Chapter 35, there is a 10-year time limit to pursue and finish their educational program. Regardless of their careers, caregiver status, loss of a loved one, family obligations, etc. Now we believe that this delivery date should be removed completely. So what is being done? Well, there is hope. H.R. 2327 was introduced in April 2021, and it would remove the delivery date for this benefit. Now, unfortunately, the bad news. It only has one co-sponsor, and that co-sponsor happens to be the bill, the person who introduced the bill. <clears throat> and it would remove the delivery date for those who are eligible. However, for those who received Chapter 35 on or after August 1st, 2020. 
We encourage you to contact your representatives and tell them that we need this for all surviving spouses without an eligibility date. That is for all of us, not just for those who receive this in the future. So it should come as no surprise to anyone, maybe you've heard about it, but that COVID has made a dramatic impact on the veteran community. And as of June 2021, over 12,000 veterans have died from the novel coronavirus. A concerning aspect of this virus is that some commonly service-connected conditions, particularly amongst Vietnam veterans, like diabetes, heart and lung disease, increases the morbidity rates amongst the afflicted. The fear is, however, that some veterans who pass away due to this disease will not have their service-connected conditions listed as contributing factors on their death certificate. A simple oversight like this could cause months, if not years, of delays to the surviving family members who are applying for their surviving, surviving veterans. We are asking Congress to pass legislation that would require the Secretary to obtain a medical opinion when any service disabled veteran passes away from COVID to ensure that their family members are not wrongly denied due to this oversight. <laughs> but there's plenty of arguments. Two bills have been introduced that will do just that. Senate Bill S-89 and H.R. 746, the Insurance Survivor Benefits During the COVID-19 Act of 2021, was just passed out of the Senate on July 22nd. And hopefully it will be voted on in the House soon and the president's desk in the near future. But we can't address this close to the finish line. We have to keep pushing. Again, please stay informed of all the congressional updates by signing up for DAB's Commanders Action Network or DABCAN.org. Again, that is DABCAN.org. Because who can? DABCAN. And together, we can assure that those who have lost their loved ones in the service of their nation either overseas or many years after they took off their dog tags and taken care of. Because together, we can and we should. Now, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And it is my sincere pride to introduce the newest member of the legislative team and the first introduction of the Associate Legislative Director, Mr. Tony Lewis.
it became final, but in response to the pushback from the DSOs, the BDA launched a pilot program, which they called the Claims Accuracy Request Program. This was just established in April of this year. The way the program works is if a BSO identifies an error within 30 days of the decision date, that BSO can submit a claim accuracy request, or CAR. And with a claim accuracy request, the claim would be allowed an expedited higher level review. Now, no, 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 no. It's too early to tell how successful the program is going to be. The DAB is going to evaluate this program, and if it's successful, the DAB will support getting this program codified into law. If not, the DAB will support S-458, that's the Veterans Claim Transparency Act. This is a bill that would reestablish that pre-decisional review. And it's worth mentioning that this bill was introduced by John Tester, the chairman of the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee. The way it stands now, the DAB is strongly encouraged by this collaboration with, with uh, BDA. And we remain optimistic that the CAR pilot will address our concerns and be successful. Um, as I said, if it is successful, we'll be pushing for this to be, become a law. Um, if it's not so successful, we'll be pushing for reestablishment of the 48 hour review. Next, protecting veterans' effective dates. So currently, if a veteran submits a claim or an appeal on the wrong form, it could take VA months to review and advise that veteran the claim will not be accepted because it was submitted in the wrong form. Additionally, VA doesn't consistently advise the veteran which form should have been used, and it doesn't always provide the correct form to the claimant. As a result, when the veteran eventually files the correct form, he or she may have lost months of entitlement, or may have even lost a, um, an appeal period. <coughs> this issue was complicated by implementation of the AMA, which requires very specific forms to be used. For example, VA won't, won't accept the claim for any previously denied issue on a form except for the 0995, which again, can lead to significant delays or loss of an earlier effective date. If a veteran submits an appeal to the Board of Veterans' Appeals, it can be months and months before that's discovered, and the veteran can even incur expiration of that appeal period. It's the AP's position that this process places an unnecessary burden on too many veterans, which wasn't the intent of Congress when it passed the AMA. Now, I apologize in advance for the image on this next slide, folks. <laughs> <laughs>
for years there have been proposals to pick the pocket of TD of the veterans and take TDIU from veterans. There have been proposals such as placing restrictions such as age on TDIU or even, even eliminating the program altogether. In fact, the Congressional Budget Office made recommendations in 2013, 2014, 2016, and 2018 to limit and or restrict TDIU. And in 2020, the CDO report considered a proposal titled NBA's Individual Unemployability Payments to Disabled Veterans at the Full Retirement Age of Social Security. And why is this? Why is such the such everybody going after TDIU? PAYGO. Because of PAYGO rules, Congress is required to offset the cost of new legislation by cutting current programs. And one of the main targets has been TDIU. And this becomes a real threat when we look at the cost of toxic exposure bills, like Shane talked about, the one trillion dollar bill that, that we're advocating for that costs us to come from somewhere. But we say, not from TDIU. The agency's goal? To protect TDIU, we have to have it codified into law. That way, the VA will not be able to just make a regulatory change and restrict TDIU. It will take an act of Congress. So our goal is for Congress to pass H.R. 5028, the Protecting Benefits for Disabled Veterans Act, and protect TDIU, which brings it back to the critical policy goal, protecting veterans in the same when it processes. Thank you. Tony did a great job. The only thing he didn't do was introduce our next speaker. But hey, give Tony a little bit more love. Come on. Great job, Tony. So now we'll bring up to you another uh, member of the team, the one, the only, the uh, Assistant Legislative Director, Marky Biggerfield. It's still morning, so good morning. Good morning. All right. As Shane has mentioned, I am Assistant National Legislative Director, Marky Biggerfield. I'll be talking to you today on two presentations one for mental health services and suicide prevention efforts. And once that's concluded, I'll be talking to you about VA's fiscal 2022 budget. But we're gonna begin with the mental health and suicide prevention efforts. Uh, we'll be going over the 2020 suicide report, implementations of a new law, uh, new legislation, the Sergeant Ketchum Rule Veterans Health Act, uh, some DAV can alerts that you should be aware of, and also some hearings that we testified at earlier this year. We'll begin by talking about the 2020 Suicide Veteran Report. The report covers most recent data for the reporting period from 2017 to 2018. The report expands upon previously previous reports, including veteran suicide rates by race, ethnicity, responding to local, international, and national issues. Uh, the report noted that for the period of 2017 to 2018, that the suicide rates uh, didn't have a significant increase uh, from 17.5 to 17.6. Uh, the annual report also noted that the number of veteran suicide deaths increased by 0.6% during 20, from 2017 to 2018. Uh, the and it also noted that suicide rates among veterans that received care from the Veterans Health Administration were lower than those that did not. Implementation of a new law. On April 20th of this year, DAV submitted formal comments to the Federal Register for the first phase of the Staff Sergeant uh, Parker Gordon Fox Suicide Prevention Grant Program. This particular grant program mandates that VA establishes the program to reduce veteran suicide through a three-year community-based program to reduce suicides through uh, for eligible veterans and entities to provide coordinated suicide prevention services to veterans and their families. 
Uh, the DAB's comments focused on four areas, distribution and selection of grants, development of the measures and metrics for administering the grant program, uh, use of non-traditional and innovative approaches to treat grants for suicide prevention uh, services, and grant entities referral to VA for care for veterans at risk of suicide or other mental behavior or mental health conditions. Kind of ran over that pretty quick, so I'm sorry. Um, also, for new legislation, uh, Senate Veterans Affairs Committee Chairman John Tester and Ranking Member Jerry, Jerry Moran introduced the Reach for Veterans Act. This act would make improvements to the Veterans Crisis Line for VA based off of the VA OIG report. Um, these improvements would include improving staff training, quality review and management procedures, and also the implementation of a new suicide crisis number, uh, the 988 number by July of next year. Also for new legislation, we have the American Indian and Alaska Native Veteran Mental Health Act. This, act. this legislation is aimed at improving mental health and suicide prevention efforts for minority veterans, American Indian, and Alaska Native veterans by ensuring that all VA facilities have minority veteran coordinators and that those individuals are trained in culturally appropriate service delivery methods. And also we have the Women Veterans Transition uh, Residence Utilization Support and Treatment Act or the Women's Trust Act. The Trust Act has a mental health component that considers the unique needs of women veterans. Women veterans who suffer from PTSD as a result of MST uh, or identify themselves as LGBTQ have increased risk for developing substance use disorder. Substance use disorder is noted to have increased risk for suicidal behavior, especially in women. On June 30th of this year, HR 2441, the Sergeant Ketchum Rural Veterans Mental Health Act was signed into law by the President. This bill requires the VA to establish and maintain three new centers for the range program in areas of interest from personnel and a need for additional mental health care in rural, for rural veterans. The range program serves veterans in rural areas who are experiencing mental health illness. The program's goal is to enable veterans to live successfully and as independently as possible in their community settings. Through assertive, community-based, and clinical case management and psychotherapy, <coughs> the program promotes, program helps and promotes to restore mental health of this veteran population. Some DAV candidates to make you aware of. Uh, the first is HR 19, I mean 914, Dental Care for Veterans Act. This bill will require the VA Secretary to furnish dental care in the same manner as any other medical services and defines a four-year implementation program beginning with veterans in priority groups one and two for veterans with service-connected disabilities rated at 30% or more in the first year. Uh, S894, the Higher Veterans Health Heroes Act. This legislation will require the Department of Defense to identify health care professionals interested in transitioning from active military service to share information with the VA for the purpose of potential employment with the VA. Uh, S1664, this legislation would direct the VA to update an ongoing national training, national training program for claims adjudicators who review claims for post-traumatic stress disorder <clears throat> to undergo mandatory training. Additionally, the bill would require the VA to track the quality of those PTSD claims. And finally, HR 3452. This legislation would add preventative medications and services to the list of no fee treatments that VA covers and eliminate copayments for such services. All of these alerts and more can be found on the DAB Commanders Action Network website. And finally, under the program, I mean, finally under this session, on June 23rd, our national 
uh, Legislative Director Joy Ewan testified at a hearing. And during that hearing, there were uh, a number of bills that were talked about that pertain to mental health and suicide prevention. Uh, specifically, S-544, that directs the VA to designate one week of each year as buddy check week uh, and providing training for peer awareness checks for veterans. And uh, the Solid Start program, which was S-1198. Also, on July 14th, I testified at an HVAC hearing that covered some issues, that covered a number, a number of bills as well. Uh, in particular, uh, the HR 3674, the Vet Center Support Act, and a discussion draft about legislation to furnish Vet Center readjustment counseling for related mental health services to veterans and members of the armed forces for use with certain educational assistance benefits. So that is all for that. The first portion. <laughs> now we're going to get into the budget. VA's fiscal year 2022 budget requests. And as mentioned earlier in the presentation, all of these slides will be available on the on our website. So the independent budget is released every year with our ID partners. And it's, it's an independent estimate of what the VA will need for the next year for all the benefits and services that are coming up. The federal budget is normally due out the first Monday in February. But with the change in administration, this year's budget was a little late. The independent partners worked hard to release the budget every year, and every year we try to make sure that that independent budget is released on time. This year, the independent budget was released on February 1st. <clears throat> this year, there are some extra areas of concern due to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. A lot of veterans deferred their care because they were uncertain about the pandemic and whether or not the VA was open. And as we found out, a lot of the VA closed their doors, so veterans were concerned about where, where they would be able to get their care or continue their care. Uh, unemployment. Uh, more veterans were looking for services because they lost their jobs. They didn't have anywhere to go to get the care that they need. So they were looking to the VA to help maintain and continue their care that they lost when they lost their jobs. And as far as inflation, estimating what it will cost the VA to buy the items that they need for care for the veterans in the next year. The VA released their budget on May of this year. And with the help of DAV and other partners, VA health care was taken care of via advanced appropriations. VA has already received funding for medical care for the next fiscal year. However, VA is coming back for a second bite for additional requests for Medicare, medical care issues. This on top of the money that they are already receiving from advanced appropriations. In addition, the VA has three additional sources that they will be able to receive funds from. The Reoccurring Expenses Transformational Fund, and from that fund they have approximately $820 million at their disposal. The American Rescue Plan, which was part of the COVID relief package, there is $17 billion for VA, primarily for VA health care, but also they have money for areas like VBA and information technology. These funds will be available next year as well. And finally, the American Jobs Plan. These are proposed funds because this is part of the infrastructure bill that I will discuss later in the presentation. DAV and its IB, IB partners reviewed the VA budget and testified to Congress that if approved, together with the other sources of funding, this would be the first time it would fully fund the VA for a generation. Now I'm going to highlight a few important areas of the VA budget. To start with, we're going to talk about VA-provided medical care. The funds that I'm going to discuss here provide for the hospitals, clinics, doctors, and nurses. The IB recommended $81.4 billion, and the VA requested $78.1 billion. However, there is an additional $12.5 billion for the VA from the COVID relief bill. 
Most of it goes to COVID-related care, also to veterans who have deferred their care because of the pandemic. We are also pleased to note that the VA board is proposing to hire approximately 17,500 new healthcare employees to increase its ability to provide timely health care. For medical community care, this is health care that is provided outside of the VA in the community care network provided by Optum and Tri-West. The IB recommended $20.7 billion and the VA requested $23.4 billion. Plus, they have an additional $2 billion from the American Rescue Plan to help support community care. Due to many veterans deferring their care because of the COVID-19 pandemic, VA expects to see more veterans coming back into the VA next year to get care that was deferred during the pandemic. This additional money does not represent a shift from VA, but a growth that is expected to occur when the Mission Act was created. VA's budget will shift back down for the following fiscal year for 2023. For medical and prosthetic research, it is important to note that VA provides key research. This research not only helps the veteran community, but it also helps the national health care system as well. The IB recommended a 10% increase from fiscal year 2021 to include an additional $10 million for women veterans research to focus on gender specific issues. The VA's request was an 8% increase from fiscal year 2021, and the VA would like to focus on traumatic brain injuries, COVID-19, and toxic exposure all very important issues. When it comes to the Veterans Benefit Administration, the IB recommended an increase to help address the claims backlog. Currently, there are 190,000 claims pending adjudication. The IB recommended that the VA hire an additional 1,000 employees to help address this backlog situation. The VA request was a little lower than the IB but the VA gets to count on an additional $272 million from the American Rescue Plan. The IB is concerned about the difference in the new FTE request. We would like to see them beef up staffing to include new employees for the VA call center and the Freedom of Information Act request office. For the Board of Veterans Appeals, to address the needs of the board, the IB recommended $216 million to help eliminate the hearing backlog and hire new employees. The VA requested $228 million, but noted less employees than the IB recommended. For information technology, the IB recommended $5.2 billion to include $175 million for BDA to address ways to improve how they digitize documents, $25 million for the Board of Veterans Appeals to help manage their face flow system that they use for day-to-day -day operations, and for artificial intelligence systems to be able to search for documents and information in a, in a quicker manner. And uh, for VA research, it was $42 million to make sure that VA has cutting-edge IT software. The IB wants to make sure that VA monies are being used and, and not spent just on VA healthcare, but also to ensure VBA receives funding that they need to be as, as effective as possible. For the electronic health record modernization, this is a huge project. This will allow VA, DOD, and the private sector to share information. The IB recommended $3 million to include $60 million for improved access to veterans and streamline the medical appointment scheduling process. <clears throat> VA paused the electronic health record modernization until a strategic review was completed. This review has caused a slowdown of the rollout of the electronic health record across the country um, to ensure that they have the proper tools that they need, like high-speed internet to make sure information flow can go continuously. For major and minor construction, the IB recommended $2.8 billion for major construction and $810 million for minor construction to build new healthcare facilities and expand and repair existing facilities. The IB's recommendation also included $1 billion 
to address, vet, to address VA's seismic differences with its aging hospital infrastructure. The VA requested $1.6 billion for major construction and $553 million for minor construction with an additional $150 million available from the transportation fund. Also, there is a very huge infrastructure proposal on the table from the administration that includes $18 billion for the VA. $15 billion of that is for uh, VA's new hospitals and another $3 billion for smaller facilities and non-reoccurring maintenance. The $18 billion proposal would not be spent in one year, but over several years. This is a very large if, and if this uh, is available, this will make the VA's budget even stronger. Next steps. Both sides have to pass their appropriations bill. The House Appropriations Committee has passed their version of the Military Construction and Veterans Affairs Appropriation Bill. The Senate Appropriations Committee has not passed their bill yet. Then the House and Senate have to reach an agreement on the, with the administration in order to pass this bill. This should also be completed <coughs> prior to the fiscal year, which starts on October 1st. If this does not happen, then Congress usually has to pass a CR or continuing resolution to keep the government funded while they reach an agreement. Uh, if they don't, then there's a possibility of a government shutdown. However, thanks to DAB and getting advanced appropriations, the VA healthcare system will continue to be funded without interruption. Here are some additional resources if you would like to take a look at the independent budget, the VA budget, and then the independent budget testimony that was offered on June 9th. Like I said, the slides are available on our website, so you don't have to worry about trying to brush and take pictures. The information will be there for you to get to, to see what you need to see. Uh, thank you for your time and attention, and I will be followed by Director Ashley Barton. Well, thank you, Marquis. Can everybody hear me? I'll try and use my good girl voice. <laughs> All right, so hello, everyone. I am Ashley Burns, DAB's Deputy Communications Director. I know I'm short on time, so I'll try to keep this moving. Um, but I'll be giving an update on our critical policy goal of ensuring equitable benefits and services for women and minority veterans. So, Real quick, just want to highlight the why here. Why the need to continue our focus on women and minority veterans issues. You know, when we say minority, we're talking about individuals who, when the VA was created decades ago, they either weren't part of the patient demographic, you know, people who look like me, um, or made up just a negligible fraction of the population. So therefore, their needs were never fully taken into account uh, in how the VA does its outreach, how they practice their health care, or how they deliver services. So, Still some catching up to do and, and looking at these growing populations, what they need, what issues are specific to them, and how VA can adapt what they're doing to meet their needs. So, VA must ensure that enrolled, health, enrolled veterans have equitable access to their earned health care and other programs and services, and they must work to improve health outcomes, which, as we know, in many cases happen to be lower within minority populations. VA can do this by prioritizing data collection and analysis to better identify health trends, things like the Million Veteran Program, collecting that data, looking at how they can use it to inform healthcare providers and, and come up with better solutions, reviewing methods of service delivery to underrepresented and underserved veteran populations by investigating cultural differences that may be creating barriers to accessing VA, and by creating a safe, harassment-free VA environment for all veterans. So we've been very glad to see early on a focus on women and minority veterans in the 117th Congress and from VA itself. Uh, there have been a number of bills introduced and hearings held to include my very first hearing uh, on March 18th. <laughs> um, that focused on gaps that still remain for women veterans. Now, as we continue to work with Congress to ensure the implementation of the provisions uh, from the Deborah Sampson Act, which was passed into law, January, 
there are still some areas that we know where work needs to be done, things like maternity care coordination, uh, women-specific drug and alcohol dependency programs, and understanding links between things like toxic exposure and women's health and reproduction. DAB also testified on a number of bills that either focused directly on women and or minority veterans or that contained applicable provisions at legislative hearings on April 15th and on June 23rd. And then on May 12th, I was incredibly proud to watch National Area Supervisor Carmen McGinnis deliver a really incredible and powerful testimony before the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee on improvements to MST claims processing. Shane was also there. <laughs> If you haven't seen it, I would, I would advise going and looking at it. These links are all live. If you go and check out the uh, presentation here online, you can click right on it and watch Carmen mention. So. And then we continue. Let me see if I can Um, so DAV also took part in a closed door roundtable with the House Veterans Affairs Committee in April on ending sexual assault and harassment at VA, and that discussion was largely focused on the role that VSOs play in that effort, which is great because we all do have a part to play in that, right? We're the ones that are actually walking the halls of VA, we're the ones who, if we see something uh, taking place, we have a responsibility and a duty to stand up for our fellow veterans and, and let someone know that we see inappropriate behavior happening, right? So DAV actually got a very nice shout out at that discussion um, because National Commander Whitehead has been incredibly engaged in this effort. You may have seen him out on our social media accounts um, calling on all of us to be part of that cultural shift at VA. VA Secretary uh, Dennis McDonough has also hosted a roundtable discussion that was back in March, uh, which included a few of our DAV members and NSOs, just to get the pulse on what's working and perhaps most importantly, what isn't working for women veterans at VA right now. And then we continue to work with the Congressional Women Veterans Task Force um, and with VA itself to you know, kind of see what's going on and help move their efforts along on um, their, you know, their campaign to end sexual harassment and assault, things like the White Ribbon Campaign. Um, so DOD recently wrapped up a 90-day independent review commission on sexual assault in the military. And you may have heard of that, kind of a big deal. Um, and Secretary, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin um, has been very supportive of, of the recommendations in that, um, including pretty significant change in the handling of those cases by removing them from the chain of command, um, and instead they'll be handled by independent military lawyers. So that's, that's huge, really, and that really, you know, look at how things lead over from DOD into VA and where the cultural change needs to start. It needs to be kind of a two-fold effort. VA needs to be tackling it, but it really needs to, to begin with DOD. VA also underwent a sweeping review earlier this year to ensure that its policies are non-discriminatory towards both veterans and employees based on sexual orientation and gender identity. And additionally, uh, VA in June released a chart book with new data on LGB veterans, which not only looks at numbers, but also looks at how health for LGB veterans compares to non-LGB veterans, of course we say LGB, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender is not included in this particular chart book. But we know that that's an important part of a veteran's medical record and, and how providers are able to best provide care to them. And then here are some of the bills that have been introduced in the 117th Congress thus far that specifically focus on women or minority veterans. There are other bills that, <coughs> that pertain to these groups as well, but I want to try and keep this list pretty succinct. So I'll run through these, run through these a little quickly, but again, check out the slides online and you can get a, a deeper look. Um, the Protecting Moms Who Served Act, oh, by the way, I have a little graphic down there in the House and Senate side, you can get the bill number, I'll see if there's a new piece of legislation in them. The little blue check mark lets you know if it's passed. So, DAV can, folks, I want to see more of these blue check marks. So the Protecting Moms Who Served Act uh, adds resources for maternity care coordination, something I've personally used and it's fantastic and I want to make that sure that's more available for uh, women veterans out there. Uh, it's especially important because all of that care happens outside of the VA in the community and uh, it, it helps to make sure that what, you ha what happens on the outside gets back to VA, that all of that care is coordinated. The uh, Doula Act 
establishes a pilot program for doula services to foster better child and maternal health outcomes. And for those of you who are not familiar, a doula is essentially um, an advocate for pregnant women um, and new mothers, for which you know, for women veterans, that's incredibly important because we know that there are a lot of service-connected disabilities that can impact uh, negatively health outcomes for both mother and child. The Veterans Family Health Services Act broadens access to fertility services. It also has some provisions specifically to um, the reproductive health needs of veterans with um, service connected disabilities, spinal cord, MST, mental health, gender urinary, uh, as well as one thing, again, this is right up Shane's alley, but it requires a study on toxic exposures uh, in correlation to reproductive health, something we really just don't know that much about. The Women Veterans Trust Act, which Marquis uh, talked a little bit about, just making sure that we know um, what women need when it comes to residential treatment programs for drug and alcohol rehabilitation. Um, the Equal Access to Contraception Act uh, prohibits VA from requiring co payments for contraceptive items, and that's in line with what private insurance health companies uh, offer and what women in the military currently have as well. So just bring some equity to that. The Service Act. And this is, I'm going to pause for a second on this one. Can anybody tell me what age when we start to require mammograms? 44? I hear a lot of women going, Damon, you should know this too. Lots of fun stuff starts to happen at 40, right? That's when all the good stuff. Now, anybody want to venture a guess at how old I am? probably smart. You guys are trained well. You know better. Yeah. I'm 37. I'm also a veteran of Afghanistan. I have been exposed to burn pits. What happens to me between the age of 37 and 40? Nothing. I sit and wait, right? What happens if I develop breast cancer between now and then? What is one of the most important things about cancer treatment? Early <coughs> detection, right? So this, the Service Act would expand eligibility for VA mammography screenings for women veterans that are beyond the commonly practiced age criteria of 40 years old, um, opening, it up, opening it up to those who have served in specific locations and time frames where burn pits were known to be used overseas. I'm a huge fan of this bill. I think it's right up the alley of what we need. We see this women veterans population growing. We know younger women are going to be coming in. We have to make sure that we're protecting them. So the service act, ladies and gentlemen. Enhancement for MST Survivors Act, this is another goodie, uh, requires VA to provide MST claimants an assigned peer support specialist throughout the claims process unless the veteran decides to opt out. And that tracks with the hearing that we had on uh, May 12th, in which DAE testified that, go figure, MST claims are pretty unique and that VA should be working more closely with the veteran to ensure that they understand the process. They have a, that they understand the resources that are available to them and that they know what to expect so that the process is not re-traumatizing to them. The Justice for Women Veterans Act uh, required the GAO um, Government Accountability Office study on the thousands of members of the armed forces that were involuntary, involuntarily separated or discharged from the military as the result of pregnancy or parenthood. So that could be adoption or becoming a step having your child. And this is whether you became pregnant voluntarily, whether you were the victim of a military sexual trauma, across the board, if you got pregnant, they were allowed to root you out. And those women were not given counseling, they were not linked up with veterans' benefits, and they did not have the discharge status to enable them to receive VA benefits. So this is a study to help identify the scope of the impact of that policy, uh, including disproportionate impact by race and ethnicity. And then the MAMO Act, which would require uh, VA to develop a strategic plan within a year of its enactment to create a telemography pilot, um, enhance BRCA testing. Again, just for this focus on early detection and making sure that we're giving women veterans access to the services they need um, to get the best, best care that they can, um, especially when we know that women veterans are uh, more at risk. They're at higher risk for developing breast cancer. The Veterans and Families Information Act and the American Indian and Alaskan Native Veterans Mental Health Act, these are two that are kind of aimed more on the minority veteran side. 
Um, I know Marquis mentioned about the, um, the second bill there, and just a little uh, note there, it has passed the House that was just this week we found out, so yay! <laughs> information act. This is another simple one, just making sure that um, the VA develops its fact sheets, not only in English, but in the 10 most commonly spoken languages in the U.S., to ensure that they are breaking down those barriers. Say you have a caregiver that doesn't necessarily speak English that well. We want to make sure they know what, what literature is out there, right? They're going to be able to get access to what they need. So uh, that one is also passed in the House. I'll go ahead and close it out here. Um, by giving you a shameless plug that the Women Veterans Seminar is on Monday uh, from 2 to 4 in the HB Plant Ballroom. If you want to hear a little bit more, we'll have some uh, guest presentations from uh, Chairwoman Julia Brownlee. So we did a great interview with her that you guys will have a chance to watch. So talking about the Congressional Women Veterans Task Force and kind of where they're moving ahead. Leela Jackson is the director of VHA's Assault and Harassment Prevention Office also a Marine Corps veteran. And she'll be talking about VA's efforts and harassment, how VSOs play a role. Uh, she'll be offering us the chance to take the white ribbon pledge and maybe, just maybe, walk away with a free gift. And then from VBA, we'll have Cheryl Rawls, who's the Executive Director for Outreach, Transition, and Economic Development, and Stephen Ellis, who is a Senior Customer Experience Strategist, and they'll be discussing outreach to women veterans on the benefit side, as well as the Women Veterans Journey Map, which they've done some cool work on. I thought it was just something you guys might want to stay tuned into. It's pretty neat. Uh, but they're going to be detailing the Women Veterans experience. So I really hope to see you there. Thank you all so much for your time and attention. And I will now go ahead and pass it back to our fearsome, fearless leader, Joy. Thanks, Ashley. You see why we want to be part of our team. <laughs> She's doing a great job. Um, I'm going to try to make this really quick so we have time for some um, fun right at the end. I don't want to have you going away on a serious note. Uh, the last presentation here is uh, just a quick update on building a veterans health care system for the future. This is one of our critical policy goals for the 117th Congress. And uh, we want to make sure that part of achieving this goal um, is going to make sure we have that faithful implementation of VA Mission Act, realigning and modernizing VA's infrastructure, completing the IT and electronic health record modernization efforts, and strengthening VA's fourth mission. As part of the Mission Act, uh, which was passed in 2018 and became effective, one, uh, Three of the principles that we were very um, wanted to make sure were included were that VA remains the primary provider and coordinator of VA care. Um, the new veteran care networks were being established um, so veterans would have access to care in the community if VA was not able to provide that care or provide it in a timely manner. And then making sure that quality and access standards um, are equal. We want to make sure that VA had healthcare uh, vacancies filled within the VA facilities. We know uh, there were lots of healthcare vacancies, and being able to expand that capacity is critical for VA to uh, serve veterans. We also want to make sure the quality of care is equal to uh, that care in the community is equal to the VA care um, that is provided in the there's evidence-based treatments and that, better, um, that clinicians who see veterans have a cultural competency and understand the uh, illnesses and injuries related to military service. And we also wanted to make sure that VA improves scheduling its scheduling systems uh, to lower wait times. Yes. provisions for the um, uh, AIR Act, and part of that is looking at VA's infrastructure. VA has a huge portfolio of its physical infrastructure, over 50, uh, 5,600 buildings, over 170 plus uh, VA medical centers, and over 1,000 clinics um, in a community, but the average age of VA facilities is 50 years old, so major uh, time frame, uh, we just don't see, you know, hospitals um, that, are, that are that old out in the community. And 
EPA started estimating through its own uh, plan, which is the Strategic Capital Infrastructure Plan, or SCIF, in 2010, that they had a backlog of $56 billion in um, modernization, rebuilding that would need to be done, and that in you know, just a 10 year period uh, jumped up to 66 billion. 66 billion. So that's not going away. And as part of um, you know why this has happened, we've just had current, you know decades of underfunding uh, for VA hospitals and their facilities and the upkeep that it costs to maintain such a this large physical infrastructure. And we know that uh, these infrastructure needs, we, we got to adapt. There's a changing way that healthcare is delivered, especially over the last, you know, just even the last uh, 10, 15 years. And the veteran demographics have changed. You know, we have older veterans, we have younger veterans, we have a large diversity um, in the veteran population and where they live now, which was very different from when the facilities were built. So, one of the things that, um, just to give you that quick background on the AIR Act, or the, uh, I mean the AIR provisions that were in the Mission Act, was that during this 2021 period, right now the criteria is being finalized on how VA is going to evaluate uh, looking at its infrastructure. Commissioners are being, um, the packages have been in and they have to be um, nominated. Those nominations then will have to uh, come forward and then those will have to go through the Senate uh, and be confirmed. So it's gonna be an incredibly uh, important uh, commission and we want to see um, all of 22 will be sent where VA um, has their realignment plan evaluated by the commissioners, and then they're going to uh, hold hearings, uh, public review, and information that will come out based on uh, what VA's recommendations are. They'll have a year to do their work, and then they'll be sending their plan to the president in January 2023, and then it will go through a review process by the president and the Congress, who can either approve or reject it. So you're going to be hearing a lot about this in the year um, ahead. DAV's vision for modernizing VA infrastructure, we have some uh, key points. We want to make sure that there's full funding for existing VA healthcare facilities. We want to have VA invest uh, their money wisely, that they're provided by Congress to meet future needs of veterans. And this is going to require some reforming of the infrastructure funding, how it's done. You have to plan for the upkeep of that infrastructure as well. Um, and then reforming construction oversight is key. If you've been following this issue at all, you know how long it takes to get approval from Congress to build something new, how long it takes to execute it, how what cost overruns can really put a a damper on things, to have to go back to Congress and ask for more money, and it's 10 years to get a facility built at a, at a short span. Also part of the modernization efforts are the electronic health record modernization. We know uh, VA has adopted Cerner, as DOD did, to try and have a seamless electronic health record. 10-year project, $16 billion. Uh, started in the Northwest in Ohio and not without problems, as you've probably heard. Again, you're following the issues. Uh, OIG and GAO reports, and hopefully, we're going to hear um, a little bit more on an update from our VHAS tomorrow on um, that issue. But we want to have universal interoperability in those systems so that when you come from DOD and whether you're in VA and then you see that part time in the community, they're going to get those records back to VA so you can have a good, uh, comprehensive healthcare record that's not having the gaps and holes that we have now. Um, also, a comprehensive scheduling package uh, between the VA and um, in the community. We know that is just not. Uh, happening now the way we would expect it would be, but we need the IT uh, for VA to be able to do that more seamlessly. And finally, um, the fourth mission of VA, absolutely critically important. It serves as a backup for DOD in period of wartime. 
but support for medical response to terrorism and natural disasters. You've seen VA do that uh, you know, in many locations across the country. And during national health emergencies with the pandemic, we see how important the VA is to assist like they did early on in the pandemic uh, for, with regard to the nursing homes and helping out to make sure that our elderly and uh, more vulnerable were uh, taken care of. So that is in a nutshell. We've got to really look at the lessons learned from COVID, developing workspaces for the future, properly balancing tele telehealth and telemedicine. And that's still to be seen how effective that was which we all had to do over the last year and more. And then the supply chain issues, uh, making sure that VA has its own supply, uh, along with DOD for these emergencies, and we saw how critical that was in making sure that the hospital employees and first line providers had the PPE that they needed to care for veterans. And just overall, the importance of the VA healthcare system. We can't let that slip away during this modernization. Um, and for people who think, well, we can just get everything we need in the community and we just shouldn't do this investment. So I think you've heard enough. You've been very great audience and patient. So now we're gonna just do a little bit of fun and I'm gonna turn it over to Jeremy for a little trivia and a little um, future bit. Nobody goes away here. I appreciate it. Sorry, 
Okay, one shot, one shot, one kill. So here you go. Here's a sticker, Better Risk Protection Team. Thank you for being a member of it. <laughs> Let's go over here to the person with the lovely hat. How are we doing, sir? What's your name? Where are you from? What branch? Wilbur Buchanan, Texas Army. Oh. Oh. Right. How many co-sponsors in the center of this? 38. 38, is he right? Yeah. Awesome, look at that bounce right here. What do we got? There it is, you have a lovely double bag. Again, DAV branded as it can only be. <laughs> All right, for my presentation and this, please, humor me, okay? What is the new, the new remergence? to retain the DIC benefits. All right, where have I not been? Let's go over here. You know, where, first of all, where's my Massachusetts delegation? Are we out here? Yep. Anybody from Massachusetts? Because I'm not going to call on you, because every time someone from Massachusetts comes down to Tampa Bay, they win championships. All right, oh. How are you doing, sir? What's your name? Where are you from? What branch? Colwell, Newport, South Carolina, Marine Corps. All right, all right. Second shot for, for the Marine Corps. What is the new remarriage age to retain your DIC benefits again? My presentation, please pretend like we can pay attention. Yeah, 57 to 55. Oh, is he right? Yeah. Yes, he is. There it goes. 55 years young. Thank you very much, sir. Oh, man. That was great. That one made me sweat. All right. From Tony's presentation, the new guy. Please, humor him. What is the name of the pilot program Veterans Benefits Administration created to replace the 48-hour VSO review? Anybody? Oh, this gentleman with the lovely mustache right here. Pretend like you don't know each other. Do I know you? Good. Good listening to you. All right. What's your name? Where are you from? What branch? Jeff Whitney, state of Ohio, Air Force. Why am I? What is the name of the pilot program, sir? Car program. Oh, is he right? Yeah. Wow. Look at that. Even I didn't know that one. <laughs> and sir, you get a lovely one because that's what Air Force people do. All right. For Marquis, that will have the presentation. You like that too? I do too. Anyway, what HR was signed into law on June? 30th, which happened to be my 20 year wedding anniversary with my lovely wife. What age I was signed into law on June 30th of this year? Oh, I'll tell you my mouth when you get here, buddy. All right. <laughs> what age are anybody? Hey, there we go. We'll go back here. Just because I'm doing with hands, guys. Hi, <laughs> right, sir. What's your name? Where are you from? And what branch are you going to be defending their honor right now? Well, I'm going to Kansas. Army. Oh, man. Right. Oh. Good. Oh. Hey, sir. What was the HR? HR 2441. Hey. Ah. Oh. There it is. The Sergeant Ketchum Rural Veterans Medal Health Care. Thank you very much. And we want to give you a nice Bluetooth radio, sir. DAV branded. No big deal. So we get two awards for Marquis' presentation. And oh, 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 oh. <laughs> There's a freebie in there somewhere. All right. <laughs> well, we have, I'm going to go all the way to that. <laughs> How much money was proposed in the American Jobs Plan? But you know what? Because of this, that has to be a two part question. All right, sir. 18, How much is money? 18 billion. Okay, back to the question. Pronounce my last name. Pronounce my last name. Uh, Wollanova? That's nah, close enough. Yeah, we'll get it done. <laughs> 18 billion, that's a lot with a B. That's a lot of nuts. Is there one more? Yes. <clears throat> now, from Ashley's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ashley's presentation, that's right. The Marine's so nice. She became a deputy twice. Which of these is a women, women veterans bill currently in the house? Now I'm going to give you three names. You're going to have to 
pick which one is the actual act. All right, here, right here, because I saw it first. Sir, what's your name? Where are you from? What branch? Michael Coleman, Florida. Air Force. Why are you the Air Force? All right, sir. <clears throat> First of all, did you get the joke that it was that you just said that I'm sure you got the answer sure of communication that you just you got the very good. Okay, yeah, that's it. Anyway, so which is it the Equalizing Women's Health Care Act, the Service Act, or the Mama, 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 Mama Act? Is he right? Ooh. What did he say? He said the Mama Act. No. Oh, no. Oh, sorry, sir. Here you go. Again? So, anybody got, okay, this first person I saw, he seems really, really happy. First of all, what's your name? <laughs> what's your name, where are you from, what branch, sir? Michael Bob, a senior uh, from Kentucky. That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> and it's uh, Army. And what's the answer to it? Equalizing. Is he correct? The Equalizing Women's Health Care Act. So, <laughs> there you go, sir. Okay, we, we, we're some of the very, very adamant over here. The people want that. People that are going to take the room behind us are. Okay. Hi, I'm Jeremy. What's your name? Where are you from? And what branch did you serve in? My name is Callie Mullins. I'm the Senior Vice Commander of our Department of Washington. And U.S. Navy. All right. All right. <laughs> After two of them already been eliminated, which one of those three bills <laughs> is currently in the house? I feel like you should ask Marina's question to give him crown. Oh. <laughs> to our base. The service act. The service act. I, is she right? Everybody, thank you for playing along. Thank you for being here. Thank you for everything that you do. And again, thank you for reaching out to your members of Congress because who can? And we have been. Let's just keep it up. Enjoy the rest of your convention, ladies and gentlemen.